Hello, hello. If I could get everybody to take your seats, please. That was quick. Thanks, everybody, uh, for attending today. Really pleased to have this uh, women's professional soccer workshop uh, here. We've got two uh, great presenters uh, with us today, which we're really pleased to have. They're doing two separate presentations, but I'm going to introduce them together. Uh, our first presenter is a two-time Olympic bronze medalist who was a member of the Canadian women's national teams from 2003 to 2021. During her career, she represented Canada over 200 times, played in four FIFA World Cups and three Olympic Games, earning a bronze medal in both London 2012 and Rio 2016. Following her playing career, she earned an EMBA from the Smith School of Business and UEFA Master of International Players. Now as co-founder and CEO of Project Date Sports Inc. is leading the creation of Canada's first and only women's professional soccer league kicking off in 2025. Join me in welcoming Diana Matheson. Uh, joining Diana is also a two-time Olympic medalist and Olympic champion, having played for Canada from tw uh, 2008 to 2022. She represented Canada at three Olympic Games and three FIFA World Cups, having earned a bronze medal in Rio 2016 and a gold medal in Tokyo 2021. Her advocacy work in mental health has truly shifted the status quo in women's football and sport in Canada. She was a powerful leader both on and off the field, which has led her into her new pursuit as the general manager of the women's soccer or women's professional soccer for the Vancouver Whitecaps and is leading the Whitecaps as BC's only women's professional team to enter the first ever women's league in 2025. A champion of gender equity in sport, she's passionate about providing equal opportunities for girls in this country to pursue their dreams and providing visibility for more girls to see themselves in leadership positions. Stephanie Labe. Steph, I tried to find a, an old picture of when we first played together, but turns out I had a worse haircut than you, so I didn't put it in the presentation. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for having us. Uh, I'm very excited to, to come. Thanks for the invitation. It's always great to chat with soccer folks. Uh, they're, they're the best folks. Uh, I'm going to start the presentation today. I'm going to try and keep this to about 25 minutes and leave a good solid 20 for Q&A discussion, because that's always the more fun bit. Uh, I'm going to talk you through pretty much my own journey over the last two years after I retired. Um, as Jason mentioned, I went back to school right away. I knew I wanted to stay involved in building the women's professional game in Canada. Somehow, we all knew that was the missing piece. I didn't know what that looked like, whether it was NWSL, a league, or what, or what role I was playing. So I went back to school. Uh, I did get my EMBA. I went to the Smith School of Business. I was lucky enough to get uh, a scholarship for being uh, an Olympic athlete. Uh, game plan Deloitte, the Smith School, and COC has scholarships. So that it's a pretty great resource for former athletes. So I was able to get into a, a great program through that. And I also did a program through UEFA. UEFA Academy has a few programs. I did a UEFA Master for International Players, which was kind of a transition program for former pro players. Uh, 25 men and five women were creeping up on them. Uh, and it was an overview of the, the sport industry. Uh, and those, those two programs, everything I was learning in them, I was obviously applying to a Canadian market to see what would work here, what wouldn't work here when it came to women's professional soccer. Uh, so I'm going to take you back and kind of walk you through the things I learned and how they shaped a lot of the thinking of, around what we're doing now. So the, the first thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, we, we were athletes most of our career. Uh, women's athletes in our generation do go through a bit of a journey where we a little bit have to be uh, a jack or jill of all trades. Um, that was definitely one of my main learnings in the UEFA class as well. Those male players have very few life skills. Uh, we have to do a lot more. We, we do speeches, we run camps, we end up running small businesses just to have side gigs to make a little more money. But we're athletes on the end of the day. And so we lean on what we have learned through sport and bring that with us coming out of sport. And for me, I had two really clear things I wanted to bring with me. And, you know, John Herdman, for sure, best coach I played for. 
a most influential person on my career. And there were two things he did really well that I try and bring to everything I'm doing coming out of my playing career. And one was the power of a clear vision. He showed us that more than anything. And that's the thing that, that drives things forward and having a real purpose behind it uh, and always having a growth mindset. And obviously being really good at something for a couple decades and then going into something new. Uh, been a lot of learning, but that beginner's mindset is important. And one thing I saw John and the best coaches I played for do was not have an ego and surround themselves with people smarter than them and the things they do. Uh, and that's pretty much been my plan behind everything. Surround myself with people who are very good and have decades more experience in the thing they're doing than I do. But let me, uh, I'll take you back and, and go through the, the big learnings uh, over my last two years. One, not having a pro league of our own, not normal. I know you folks know this, but a lot of Canadians I think don't because we live in this country, we look around and there's no women's pro leagues, but we're behind the rest of the world. And this is a great slide out of a 2019 FIFA benchmark, uh, benchmarking report on women's football. And this is a timeline of when women's pro leagues around the world reform. So you got your really progressive nations over here, way at the beginning, been at it for decades. And way at the end, we're behind some countries you would expect us to be ahead when it comes to women's soccer. Uh, we got South Africa, Cameroon, and Colombia right at the end there. And in this past Women's World Cup, there was only two countries out of 32 nations that don't have a league of their own, and it was us, and it was Haiti. And it didn't actually say Haiti doesn't have a league, it said that information is not available. Uh, two, women's professional soccer as an industry is new. The way the game has grown, and sorry, you, you guys are such a soccer crowd, which is more so than I often speak to, so a lot of this you might know, but the women's game grew really through investment through the international game, through FIFA, through Women's World Cups, through federations investing in their national teams. We've seen this really clearly in Canada, the national team was the, the thing that put women's soccer on the map and where enough investment went for us to be really successful on the world stage early on. Uh, but as the game has grown, the money has started to go into the professional game. Uh, and really only in the last decade, and I would argue in the last five years, has this industry really professionalized and investment has started to go into it. Uh, so on the club side, there's great uh, stats out there, which there never used to be, um, around the investment that's in women's sport. And the punchline here is really women's professional soccer, same economics as men's professional soccer. The return on your investment is in the growing valuation of the team asset. Sports are a hard business year over year to drive profits. Uh, this is where you get your return on the money. So the, the great numbers we like to point out now, which, because we can, are the NWSL. Uh, owners bought in in, uh, in 2012 for 150000 to buy their clubs. Their clubs are now valued an average of $66 million. And this is a league where you can argue the money's really only gone in the last three to four years. Um, once they stop trying to put it on lifetime, it's really done well. Um, and... It used to be the argument, you know, let's, let's build women's soccer, let's invest in women's soccer because it's the right thing to do. Now, yes, it's still all that, but also it's an investment just like any other area in sport. One of the, one of the, I had a few aha moments in the UEFA class I was in. We had the guy who wrote the book Soccernomics come in and he gave the stat of 70% of men's football clubs the world round lose money. And I said, excuse me, you told us we're not allowed to lose money every year. Women's clubs aren't allowed to lose money. Uh, but it is, it's a reality. But this is where the investments come from for the people we're talking to about investing in teams in our country. The other case studies, um, which I have found really clarifying, are around the leagues and how new this product is. And the, the leagues that had started decades ago aren't necessarily the ones that are thriving. The clubs that started decades ago aren't the ones that are exploding because it hasn't been the ones that have, you know, had the baseline down here and slowly, slowly invested that are taking off. It's the newer teams, the newer leagues that have come in and put in proper investment and put it on televisions or screens for people to see and marketed it professionally that are doing really well. The angel cities of the world is the best example. 
On the league side, same thing. Mexico is a great example. They came in and their federation mandated that all their men's pro clubs were gonna add a women's club, got the investment into the game that way, went after sponsorship, put it on TV. This only happened in 2017. So kicked off in 2018, their attendance rivals the NWSL. They have fantastic playoff numbers. They started as a developmental league with caps among youth players, uh, but they've moved past that already. So that's a really great success story. Really only five years of operation. And this is a country, and I'll, I'll touch on this later, where their biggest problem right now is the machismo culture. So, and we know we have some advantages over that market when it comes to women's sport. The other one, the Women's Super League, this is the, you know, on the league side, this is the shiny gold star of the women's league everyone wants to be right now. They only became professional in 2018. I played in Norway for the first half of my pro career. I was getting offers from England. I wouldn't go there because it was semi-pro. They were training two times a week. Uh, their deal with Sky Sports and BBC, which really put them on the map, that was 2020, 2021. Like these, these are so new. Uh, and viewership after that TV deal has consistently rose every game. They've now very recently put more effort onto attendance because they had a lot of attendance pro um, problems and that's starting to rise as well, especially now that England went out and won the Euros and some of the folks in England who thought women didn't play football changed their tune because everyone loves a winner. Uh, the, the point here being it's the cases where the investment goes in you get the eyeballs on it. It's a product that grows really quickly. So punchline there, new industry. The third thing, which I think we knew, you knew, kind of through lived experience anecdotally for me in my 20 years of, of playing women's soccer, the, the sport, the industry has been held back from negative myths and biases around women's sport. People don't watch women's sport. Women's sport doesn't make money. A lot of doubled standards there. Uh, but we know this is false. And again, the last five years, we're finally getting data coming through that we can point to and say, well, no, here are the numbers uh, and start to debunk, uh, debunk a lot of these myths. Canadian Women in Sport had a great, Canadian Women in Sport is an organization. They're doing fantastic work in Canadian sport landscape right now. They had a, a report called It's Time come out in April. They had a lot of data around this. But we know now we're starting to culturally get past these. Women's sport is growing really quickly. The commercial side is growing really quickly. We're pointing to there's this huge gap right here and we're starting to close the gap. We're also getting a lot more data about who women's sport fans actually are because we didn't really know before. Uh, but now we're finding out they're a little younger. They're more diverse. They're a little more progressive than men's sports fans. And there's really cool data around women's sport fans being a little more savvy digitally because we've had to go find the sport we wanted to watch on like NWSL Twitch stream too. So like we know how to use the internet and find games on it. Uh, also women's sport fans engage more, have higher loyalty and higher, higher spend to the companies that invest in women's sport. So really good for our sponsorship case in women's sport because the fans who support the sport care that companies are putting money into the thing they love. So that's a really cool attribute about women's sport fans that is different than general men's sport fans. There was also, I'm gonna do, I got time right stuff, you know, you know what to say. Uh, I saw, I went to the, um, I was lucky enough to get a ticket to Copa 71 at the Toronto International Film Festival this year. Has anyone heard of that movie, Copa 71? Adam, just Adam, Sherman, yes. Okay, I, I had never heard of Copa 71, which was sort of the point of this documentary. It was a documentary, I don't think it has a distribution partner yet, so I don't think it's widely out there, but Serena and Venus produced it, so I'm sure it'll get picked up. But the story was essentially back in the 60s when men's soccer was really growing internationally because it was on color TV for the first time, because Pele was playing, uh, growing around the world, men's World Cup in Mexico. In different regions around the world, shockingly, women's soccer was growing too. Uh, and some folks thought it would be a good idea off the back of the Men's World Cup to have a Women's World Cup. FIFA uh, was asked and said, no, we have doctors and our doctors tell us that women's playing football is bad for their reproductive organs. And of course, they can't play football. So FIFA passed. 
So some other folks and went ahead and organized this tournament anyways. They invited five teams. Uh, it was, I always forget one, but it was Denmark, France, Argentina, Mexico, and I really got to look, obviously that other team is forgettable. Steph, can you Google that for me? Anyways, Denmark won. FIFA said, well, you can't use any of our stadiums because we don't sanction this thing. They only had two stadiums to play in, the two biggest ones in Mexico, because they kind of tried to sabotage it. Uh, but it got a huge amount of attention. And the women, um, Denmark won in the final against Italy, and they played in, in front of 110,000 people at Azteca Stadium. And then, and then the women, who obviously weren't playing pro at the time, who barely were on national teams, went home to their countries, uh, were, the, you know, the excitement died down. They went back to their federations. The woman who played for France told the story. She went back and had a banquet at her federation where the French feder uh, president basically made jokes about women's football for an hour. And then they went home, and people forgot about this tournament, and no one spoke about it again until the 90s when FIFA decided to start the Women's World Cup, and then it started to grow again. Uh, and that's, that was a moment in history that I, I had never heard of. And they had Brandi Chastain come on, um, and they had Alex Morgan on this documentary essentially to say the same thing, this, that we had never heard of this tournament. Uh, all, all to say, you know, there's real factors here historically where the game has been hampered despite incredible global interest, and we're, we're at a point finally historically where I think we can all agree we're, we're past that. Sorry, that was a bit of an aside. Number four, very important. Uh, we've got a great market here in Canada, and I, we are probably all biased, we have the best opportunity in the world to build women's professional sport with a blank canvas. Uh, some of the reasons why, the fans, we know we got this, and that's kind of linked to the one at the bottom, the culture. One of the other major learnings that had nothing to do with the speakers we had in my UEFA course was that Canada and the U.S. are a decade ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to supporting women's sport. And even the countries you would expect are right there beside us, England, Germany, etc. No. Those countries that have been historically men's football are still very much men's football, and they do not support or understand the value in women's sport as much as we do in Canada. And that is a huge advantage for us uh, that sometimes I think we don't recognize too because we live here, but we have fantastic fans that have been following this team for over a decade uh, and really positive support for women's sport. So it's a huge strength in our market. The second one, the players, we know we got them. The, the numbers I have are a bit dated, but they came out uh, before COVID. They were a 2019 FIFA member survey report when they did a, a report on all the member nations and how many girls and women were registered playing football in their own countries. At the time, Canada was third. There was more women and girls registered to play in Ontario than in the country of Mexico. And there was more girls and women registered in Quebec than in the country of Spain that just won the Women's World Cup. So players, we got them. And the other one on here, corporate support. The timing is great now in the market and Canadian companies are finally ready to put their money where their mouth is and get behind women's sport in the country. Five, uh, the other thing I learned, we had the guy uh, come in from UEFA who redesigned the Champions League format, really cool speaker. And he said, there is no blueprint blueprint for building a league. There's no blueprint for building a competition. You have to look at the realities that exist in your country and build specific for that. Uh, and we know we got an interesting market here. We're pretty unique when it comes to a lot of things, especially soccer. We're much bigger than everyone. Uh, we don't have 100 years of soccer experience. We're pretty new to the whole soccer thing, which itself is, is rare internationally. Uh, our federation doesn't have hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue to, to build from scratch. Our men's leagues are new. Our men's domestic league is only five years old. This is not the reality for a lot of other countries. And unique media landscape, and this is a big one. Most of world football runs off of media rights. The EPL is the best league in the world because they play three times what everyone else does in Europe alone. In Canada, we don't really have a media rights landscape. We have a duopoly and we have a public broadcaster who is not paying anything for media rights. So this is 
this is the world we're operating in. So we have to recognize our strengths, build off of them, but we have to mitigate the, the unique challenges we have here as well. And number six, no one was really working on it. And I spoke to as many people as I could over this 18 months, all the independent work I was doing in this area. Uh, I, I tried to talk to as many folks in the landscape as possible, figure out who was working on what. A lot of people cared about it, but no one had the time and resources to work on this full time. And in my experience, the conversations I've had over the last decade, it was always two years away. It was always two years away for whoever the, the team or, or league was that was going to work on it. Uh, and it was pretty clear that the time to build this thing was, was now. And the industry is growing so fast that we have to get into the market now to start to capture some of this value or we're going to miss it. So that led to the, the formation of Project 8. I met my, my business partner that I founded Project 8 with in my EMBA class. Uh, his name's Thomas Gilbert, Gilbert uh, no sport experience. He came from consumer packaged goods and frozen pizza. Uh, we were in the same group of seven. Uh, it was a team-based program, so we worked together in the same team for about 16 months. So I got to know him well, saw, saw how he worked, saw how he uh, worked in a team. And we founded Project 8 to build Canada's Women's Professional Soccer League. And we, we know all the reasons why in this room, because we have some of the best women's soccer players in the world. We are one of the best women's soccer countries in the world, period. It's a quickly growing uh, industry in a fantastic market uh, and we know there's a really cool tie between women that have played sport and women that work in business. It's an American stat there, the 94%, but they found that 94% of women in C-suite in the U.S. played NCAA sport. So really cool tie there. And we know in Canada, girls start sport at the same rate in this country and three and girls drop out at three times the rates. And we know some of the reasons are because there's a lack of available pathways. There's a lack of role models out there because you can't be what you can't see. So all these things drive what we do. And we know the impact is, for us, very much to do with soccer and making sure Canada continues to compete in the international stage. Um, but it's more than just the players. It's the coaches and it's the referees. It's the women and folks who work in sport medicine and sports science. It's the folks that work in sport media in this country. It's the folks that work in the business of sport. Uh, it's about building an industry in Canada and soccer can absolutely be a leader in this space. And it's great timing too, because we know hockey's coming, basketball will get there eventually. So it's a pretty cool time to be building in Canada. So Project H vision, vision is to build a women's professional soccer league in Canada. And, and to give you the overview, and I'm sure you folks have seen uh, a lot of this, hopefully, but just to go over it again, the, the vision here is to build a truly Canadian league. We get asked a lot about, you know, why not NWSL? And honestly, if you asked me five years ago, I would have said, well, let's just do NWSL, low-hanging fruit, start a team anytime. I think it was one of those things where the more you look into it, the more clear it is that the league is the answer. If we did NWSL, well, first of all, that's not the way global soccer works. It's really only Canada and the US that have this dual league thing. Uh, really, we need to have the strongest possible domestic league. But outside of that, in terms of the impact, if we did NWSL, it would likely be a team in Toronto, maybe Vancouver, so two teams total. The NWSL has always been a little wary of having a team in Canada because they don't want a national team up here competing in their league. So they would definitely limit how many Canadians played on that team. So we'd maybe have 10 Canadians here, 10 Canadians here. We'd impact a few coaches and we'd impact a few referees in the two markets that already have high performance pathways that go to the national team. So very little impact actually on our soccer and larger market in Canada, whereas a league we have the players to support the league. We have the people that work in sport to support a league. And off the bat, we have eight high performance pathways that go to pro, that go to the national team, and we start to really impact soccer in this country. So we, the plan is to build an independent league. Uh, and the decision there, again, historically, we have a men's league that's only five years old. They're still investing a lot in their league. They had to go through COVID. That's a, that's a tough ask. Uh, our plan is to bring in net new investors and owners into the league, get as much money into the sport as possible in Canada. So independent league, 
The owners themselves, uh, diverse. So obviously we started with the white caps. Greg Kerfert was my first phone call because I know he's been putting money into women's soccer in this country for two decades. Um, and then looking at other ownership groups. We can have owners that own other sport teams, soccer otherwise in this country. We can have owners that are coming independently, building investment groups. Um, so we're looking at uh, uh, many different routes to add ownership groups. Uh, we know that infrastructure, soccer-specific infrastructure, is a big challenge in the country that we, that we live in. The CPL has done a fantastic job of investing in this space, in this country. So we are looking at markets that are major population centers and have an existing place to play in year one. And then we think we can help bring investment into infrastructure in the medium to long term. Uh, in terms of the commercial model, the league will have up to eight league partners. Uh, we'll own broadcast and media, we'll own apparel, uh, and sponsorship is really what drives league revenues, and then we have a rev share that goes down to teams. Teams themselves get to sell local level sponsorships, uh, and their revenues are mostly sponsorship and game day operations. The talent, we get asked this one a lot, What's the, what tier of league is this? And I, I always go back to, uh, well, actually, Carm asked me, she's like, well, what, you know, what players can I sign? What team can I build? And I said, Carm, you can build a, you can build the best team you can for $1.5 million. And internationally, that's, that's actually pretty competitive. We're already in the top five leagues in the world. And again, new industry. We know the top five leagues in the men's game right now. Women's soccer is still going to figure out who the top five leagues are. And I, and I guarantee you we can compete over the next decade to be, to be amongst those five. So our, our model has a $1.5 million salary cap. We're looking at a minimum of 50 k per player. Right now, that's comparable to the NWSL. Their salary cap's probably going to jump a bit in the next few years here but pretty strong starting place for us internationally. And like I said, we know we have the player pool. There's 130 Canadian women right now on pro contracts abroad. Uh, and we think we can bring at least half of them home because they're either getting underplayed in terms of minutes or they're getting underpaid. Uh, so we have a, a great case to bring a lot of Canadians home. And we want to work hard to have at least one women's national team player per team. So we have recognizable players for Canadians to support. And we know that future talent is going to be incredible. I think there's white caps players, players in Ontario, players in different high performance centers in the youth program right now that are already going to be good enough to play in this league. So the next Jordan Heidema, Julia Grosso, Jesse Fleming, they're going to come up playing in this league. And then we're going to allow up to seven international players per team. So really we supplement rosters with seasoned professional players because we want this to be a professional game. We know it's going to be hard off the bat. We've got to build eight teams from scratch. That's going to be a challenge, uh, but it's only going to get better year over year. Competition format, similar season to NWSL or CPL. Preseason we're looking at in February. We kick off in April and then we play as late as we can. Uh, no promotion relegation because it's hard to sell teams to owners that might lose their team. We do live in North America, uh, so we're looking at having a postseason competition as well. But the league's obviously the most important thing. Uh, broadcast, uh, we get asked this a lot as well. One of my first conversations, um, I have a mentor who is good friends with Natalie Cook. She's a former VP at TSN and RDS, so she was my, one of my first conversations. She just retired from TSN. So we talked her out of that, and she's been involved in the, this project since the beginning, and she's leading our, our media conversations. There's two things we're trying to optimize in terms of broadcast. One, we know, again, growing product, we need this in front of as many Canadian eyeballs as possible. Not just the women's soccer fans. The women's soccer fans are going to come find us wherever we are. We have to get in front of as many Canadians as we can so we can raise awareness and give people the chance to check this thing out. Two, we have to get the production quality as high as we can get it because another problem in women's sport, it's been underinvested in and the production hasn't looked great. So you tune in, it looks like a high school game, a college game, and what you see on TV undermines the quality of the on-field product. So eyeballs and production quality are the two things we're trying to get right. So we'll actually be investing in our own production and finding the partner that can get us as many eyeballs. We think the ideal for us 
is hopefully something like a game a week on traditional broadcast and then a streaming partner for the remainder of the game. So that would be an ideal solution for us. So where we are today in terms of the work that's been done, and then I promise I'll, I'll stop talking and, and throw it over to you. So our teams, uh, we have announced three teams, obviously Vancouver Whitecaps founding team, which is a huge piece of this. We would not be where we are uh, without them. Uh, we do have a fourth market we haven't announced yet, so don't tell anyone. You guys are cool, right? <laughs> um, we probably won't announce that until the new year. Uh, four founding sponsors to begin with, and the response, again, from corporate partners has been fantastic. I got to say, especially, Canadian Tire has been a rock star behind the scenes. People moving the needle like Canadian Women's Sport and like Canadian Tire right now. They came in and they made an announcement in March that they were going to put equal sponsorship into women and men's sport in this country. They were the first Canadian company to do that. And if every other Canadian company said they were going to put equal money into men as women when it came to sports sponsorship, our, our professional sport landscape would be hundreds of millions of dollars richer. So they've set the tone for everyone in the country. And then we've been lucky in that this is a project that a lot of people care about and want to see happen. And it, there's been such a positive response, not just from soccer folks like us, from parents, kids, whoever, who come up to us and just say, thank you for doing this. We can't wait to see this happen. Same with folks that work for great businesses in this country. It's been not, it's been a strength to get really great people wanting to help us out in what we're doing. So all the folks at the bottom working hard to work with people smarter than us. 2023 uh, objectives, I won't linger on this. We had a lot of uh, goals for this year. A big one when it came to league admin was Canada soccer membership. So we got that back in May. That was a huge milestone to move this forward as we're the women's league member for Canada soccer. Uh, we're building a business. So we're hiring, uh, we're building the league governance as we go. Hiring will be ongoing. Uh, we have six employees now and about 10 agencies, uh, so it's moving quickly. League governance is being built, should be done uh, by early next year. Uh, partnerships, we actually had to slow down selling net new sponsorships because we actually had to build the 2025 deals uh, and kind of the two to four year deals with those partners we have now before we could sell net new ones. So that's been a great sign in the market. Um, and branding, we're working on branding behind the scenes and coming out with the league name. Project Aid is not the league name. Uh, we've hired some professionals to come up with a, a great league name for us. Uh, and then ownership. Ownership is really the big one. Uh, we've got four now. We know we need at least six to have a league in Canada, and the target is eight. So we'll continue selling through Q1 of next year. But that's those are really the next dominoes to fall. As soon as we have six teams, then the, the train's not coming off the tracks here. Uh, and then in terms of the, the timeline, we launched, we're building league operations this year. Once we have all the teams, the teams build uh, team operations. We kick off in 2025. We look to expand in a few years. But this one I, I wanted to use really to show the, the timing of doing this has never been better. It would have been tough to do this even three, four years ago. And the timing is not going to get better because, again, it's growing so quickly. And in terms of the international events we have, we just had a Women's World Cup. Uh, it would have been great if Canada was in it a bit longer, but we got an Olympics around the corner. So next summer, women's soccer in front of Canadian eyeballs again. We kick off in 2025. We know Women's Champions League is coming to North America. So this is a great opportunity for our teams to compete against the top clubs in the US and Mexico. This is a really cool growth opportunity for women's soccer. Uh, 2026, we all know what that is. All eyes on soccer in this country, being, uh, biggest sporting event in the world coming to our country. 2027, another Women's World Cup. And we know with these events, there is a boost in pro, women's pro league attendance and viewership. Uh, and then another Olympic Games in 28, this time in LA. So in North America, much more of a home games for us. So really great calendar of international soccer events for the first five years of a new league. So our plan is to not just join this timeline here, but to learn from what's being done and build in a country with some really great building blocks. We know it's going to be 
hard. There is no league uh, that hasn't come with its challenges, but we know the incredible opportunity that exists in Canada. So thank you again for having me today. I'm going to wrap there, and I think I only probably saved 10 to 15 minutes for questions there, but I would love to, to hear from you and, and take your questions and open it up for discussion. So, and then I'll throw it to Steph. Thanks. That's yours. Please, please, who's got a question? What are we thinking? Gail, yes. Um, we know geography obviously is a limitation in Canada, so I'm so curious to know, you know where you run into that ladder to challenge. Um, and I mean, you know, there is value in the infrastructure for me that's going to be a factor that we had jumped on board essentially. So I'm just wondering, I know that was a bit of a stumbling block, I'm just wondering if you have any others that are potentially jeopardized. Any other challenges? Uh, I think I, the the travel one, the, the main way we've tried to mitigate that is through Air Canada. Like the deal with them, will, we're structuring flights only. Like they won't be a cash partner. Some of our partners are cash partners, some are value in kind. So the intention with Air Canada is they basically cover all our flights to not make that expense for teams. Um, so that's definitely the goal there. I think right now, like there's, there's gonna be challenges, but I think once we're past six teams and we're going, I think there's nothing that can stop it. And we're just gonna have to adapt and grow as we get better. We know we're gonna get, like I have no doubt we're gonna get a ton of people off the bat. Like if we kick off in BC place, we're gonna have a pretty nice attendance. Folks are gonna be excited. We've heard consistently it's gonna be around week eight to 10 where the excitement dies off, where we have to make sure we're, we're still doing a great job at marketing this product and raising awareness as much as possible. That's, that's how we see mostly our job drive revenues uh, and just make sure as many Canadians as possible see it and it looks good when they see it so they have the chance to check out this product. And then the team's job is to have a great game day and people show up and there's an atmosphere and there's supporters and there's good football maybe, but there's an even better crowd and experience. So I think once we're done selling teams, we're flying, but and it'll probably be a new challenge every, every few months to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's 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 great timing to be honest. Their their um, their model is different in that they one owner. So Mark Walters is the owner. He had a look at the thing, uh, decided to put in X millions of dollars. So single entity. He's setting up all the teams. He's paying for them all. They they'll expand in a few years and then get new owners. Um, and, and they're great because we have a great connection with them, Jaina Heffert and the group, and we, we kind of just get to check in and see how it's going. And then we'll get to do what they're doing, but kind of three, four months behind. And we'll have three, four months to do everything and what they've had to do in a month because they essentially hit go and have had four months. Like they're still like ordering pucks right now. It's crazy. Jaina's on the phone all the time. Um, so everything almost like they just went through, they did the CBA and they went through their draft process first. So right away we were like, what did you learn from your draft? Um, and the, the thing that came out of that was, oh, we had, um, we had special exceptions for players where they could make requests to stay in a market or be drafted to a certain market. And they opened it up too much. And then that, that caused like a whole headache of work. So right off the bat, they're like, absolutely don't do that. Like do this instead. So it's going to be lots of little things like that where we're going to get to learn from them. I'm biased, but it, like, I think we've got, we've got an easier job than they do. They're like women, they don't have, we have a global market and we're behind. They don't have a global market and they're having to break ground uh, in a new league. So they're like, they, I think their attendance goals are about 1,000 a game, whereas we're projecting 3,600 to start. So it's a little bit different. But yeah, I, we're going to watch everything they do, basically, and try and learn from it. Team names. We can do way better on team names. I don't know if you guys follow that at all. Yeah, we're, we're on that already. Don't worry. <laughs> They're going to have a do-over, I think. Yeah, Chelsea. Yeah. 
Yeah, we will definitely have a collective bargaining agreement. I mean, I, I very much came from an athlete's right back, background too. I used to work with the, um, our Players Association for the national team. I was on the COC Athlete Commission. Uh, our goal is to build out the standard player agreement as best practice as we can. Like we, we have the NWSL CBA, we have the hockey one, the WNBA one, FIF Pro has really good recommendations as well too. So build it out best we can. And then hockey's different in that they already had the 200 players and could have them build the CBA before they've even started. We don't have players yet. So build the standard player agreement. And then once we have players, work with them throughout season one to hopefully have something ready by season two. But we're hoping to have a good starting place of where we're beginning. Great question. Uh, I think probably summer is the target uh, for players. Uh, the teams hopefully ramp up uh, their operations uh, January, sorry, and then they're going to have to build. The White Caps are the exception in that they have a fully functioning organization, but everyone else is going to have to build a lot more hiring for the first few months. Uh, and then we'll have the football committees going through those timelines now to build out when are our own uh, windows for player signings and other things. So likely summer would be the earliest time, but conversations are already starting uh, unofficially with players and they're gonna ramp up in the new year too. Had a great conversation with uh, Bev Priestman. She's keen to help. Uh, we think there's a pretty solid group of women's national team players that would be a good fit in the league. Cause again, they're not playing enough. They're not playing in the position Bev wants them to play in or they're not getting paid enough. So starting, we'll be having those conversations now. Steph's been talking to players for a while already uh, and early into the new year, but official signings probably wouldn't happen until the summer. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, at the pool of 130, you have more major players in the league. And then there's also talk about supplementing the international players in the team. Um, how do you find, or how do you see the progression of the league from the country that you use? Because right now, we're dealing with League One, you've got these players going to League One, and then you know, off to college, universities. Where Yeah. Do you do you touch much on this? Okay. Steph is going to get. It. I'll, I'll knock that one on to Steph. Okay. And if she doesn't answer it well enough, ask it again at the end. But I'll punt that one to Steph. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Steph fill in the gaps there. I think philosophically for us, like we feel strongly if we can bring in the top of the pyramid, we think academies are an important part of it, at least that kind of second team. We know League One is an important part of that second tier but to your point i think there is a there's a gap because there's been such a cliff for a while um and i think we collectively have the opportunity to try and figure out what's that best case and then try and build it it's hard in that i mean some provinces are doing it the same but some provinces are, are doing it differently too so we're hoping it's not too case by case but the the football folks are digging into that now and the plan is to work with um, Bev with um, Joey from the youth national teams as well and with provinces as collaboratively as possible to try and figure out what's the, the best path for everyone and who we're missing and try and fill it. I know in soccer too the problem is there's duplication too much right too like whose job is what so I think we're coming in from scratch on this one so we can try to try and address that from the beginning probably won't get it perfect but do our best to chat with everyone and figure out what it is. Steph can answer that one. Any last ones? And then I'll throw it to Steph. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks again for having me.
now I have to see if I can oh view. Huh? Hey. All right. We're gonna start off this one with a little video, which I'm hoping will get the sound working on it. Hopefully. Oh, I'm gonna wait. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I can just turn the mic on my camera or on the computer. We have the ability, but uh, it's not the same. Where's your headphones? Yeah. Hopefully, your computer just automatically. <laughs> Nope, we're not going. Nope. World that we're finally getting. Okay, Honestly, it means the absolute world that we're finally getting a professional women's team here in Vancouver. It is just another opportunity to inspire the young generation to showcase that there is a place for you in women's sports. Having a women's team in Vancouver would be an incredible opportunity, especially for all the younger players to have those role models to be able to look up to as an inspiration. It's great for the community. Vancouver has such a great supportive soccer community. They're, everyone comes out to support. And so I think it's important that we have a women's team just to show that representation and showcase the incredible talent that we have here in Vancouver as well for these younger athletes. It would mean everything. You know, it'd be finding the missing piece of the puzzle would come full circle. You know, as an alumni who used to play for the program, it's great to see that it's coming back and giving girls a, a place to play after they graduate high school. It's super important to me because I love soccer and it's one of my favorite sports to play. And if I can grow up in Canada and play it in Canada and not travel anywhere else, that'd be really important to me. And younger girls who can also see that and see that they can grow up and also play for these big teams is really important for them too. We're on the way in the right direction, which is super, super exciting. And getting the opportunity to start to push women's soccer is, is truly an honor. And I hope that we can continue to push it because women's soccer is growing and we really want to be a part of that. It's so exciting just to see women's soccer growing each day. And I can't wait to see how it's going to be in the next few years with how it's looking right now. It's so exciting. I think with a professional league coming in, uh, you know, for me, it's the biggest thing is about getting these kids there and getting them the opportunity to play in the pro game. I didn't have the, the opportunity to look up to pro women's players necessarily when I was a young player and, and I loved the game so much. So being able to prepare these players and, and help them get those opportunities means the world to me. Well, I think in having a women's team, it's going to grow the game naturally. I think it's part of it because we have so many young female athletes who play here in the community starting from very young age all the way through. And so it gives them an opportunity for players to look up to be like, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to play right here at home in front of my friends, my family. And so I think it's important to have that opportunity for those younger players. You know, they see men on TV all the time. So the ability to go out into the community and watch women Play, whether it's soccer, hockey, basketball, you name it, it's it's not just a, a Mills thing. You know, it's for everyone. And then with Project 8 coming up, I feel like we've paved a good pathway for everybody, just something to look up to, something to see as we've performed in such a big tournament and just being excited in the future for the Project 8 to come into Canada. There are young girls that look up to these athletes. Um, myself, I looked up to Steph Lave, Christine Sinclair, and that inspired me to be a better player. That inspired me to want to pursue my dreams. And I think bringing that professional team to Vancouver, you're going to see a lot more girls get involved with soccer. A lot more girls want to be involved with women in sport in general. And I think Again, I think the opportunity is just going to be endless. And I think the way that we're going to grow the game is going to be through the fans and the young players. 
I think one of the things that I would like to share is I do know, like in being an athlete and playing for the Vancouver Whitecaps, the support of the community of Vancouver is incredible for soccer. I think we there's so many people who love the game of soccer and football. And so now to have a women's team, it's going to just it's going to amplify it. It's going to, you know, when so many younger players, I think, will get excited about the sport and it's going to inspire. And with that inspiration, I think it really creates a ripple effect and, and it spills over into other sports, other athletics as well, too. So it's important that we have a team and I know it will be supported very, very well. And I'm excited for it. Uh oh. Uh oh. Nope. Sorry, folks. This next slide doesn't want to come up now. Okay, maybe I'll switch it over. Yeah, I think the video is just on the wrong. It's coming. There we go. Do this again. Let's see. There we go. All right. Pathways. Great first question there. Um, so this is uh, our national club pathway. Um, so there's a separate pathway that looks at the more provincial one. Um, but this is the biggest question that we get asked, um, and we've been diving a lot into this of what does it mean to have a professional league? And so as we can see on the top right now, we're kind of missing that top of the pyramid. So when we talk about young girls in sport dropping out between the ages of 13 and 15 at the rates of three to one, I've heard four to one, whatever it is, when they grow up and they get to that place of they're playing in high school or they're playing in league one right now at the top, it's that thought of, well, what next? I don't have anywhere else to go. And so along with, you know, hitting puberty, the self-esteem, confidence, those things that definitely affect that age group, there's also that thought of like, well, what's next and where can I go from here? Um, so there's going to be adding in that top of the pyramid is a massive piece of the puzzle in order to keep more girls, not only just in the game, but inspired to keep playing and seeing that there is that next level right here in Canada. And with that pathway, I think it's really important that it's not only going to keep that top level, but it's for us, it's about creating that base because if we don't have the base, we're not gonna get those players to the top level. So for me, like the grassroots, the youth development and the league one, like those to me are the super important in order to even have the top be possible. Um, so having more girls in the sport at the young age, in the grassroots inspired, seeing those role models, seeing the people that are playing at the top is what's gonna inspire those young girls to want to be in sport, to stay in sport at those young levels. Um, being able to add, even though, you know, we talk about the Whitecaps being the only BC team in the pro league, it doesn't mean that that's only going to affect the Whitecaps. Um, that's going to affect the whole province. And so for me, that's what's really important is for girls growing up in this province, being able to see that this is our team and that we have the chance and we have the opportunity, you know, somebody playing in League One um, on the island or somewhere else in, in mainland BC, like being able to play against the Whitecaps Academy team in League One, um, being able to have that exposure and playing against, you know, some of the players that maybe are up and down between the pro team, having that opportunity is a massive pull as well. And so I think it's going to affect the entire pathway of youth girls, not only in BC, but across the country. And so it's really important that we're adding in that top of the pyramid and that top piece in order to finish that because we do from the travels I've been doing and learning we have an incredible academy structure but right now the academy structure is built to help players make the national team that's what it is we have three main centers across Canada and it's all how can we get players to the youth national team that's what the focus is that's what the top of our pyramid is and so we have to change that we have to change that into as D was saying eight separate pathways across the country into pro environments that's going to develop more diverse type of player. Right now we're developing players that fit into the Canadian national team system. We want to create different types of players, more diverse players, players that have different skill sets that are going to push those, but at the same time give more opportunities to more types of players and more types of girls growing up in this sport. Um, another big one for me of a big 
um, bonus of this is women in leadership positions. And I'm, I'm not just talking coaches. I'm talking physiotherapists, chiropractors. I'm talking statisticians, talking commentators, um, general managers, presidents, ownership. Um, there's so many opportunities in what has historically been a very male dominated industry. And so for us, this is also about job opportunities and creating leaders in a country where the women have actually dominated in this sport. Um, it's still typically on the, the business side of it, very male dominated. So giving more opportunities. We've had some incredible female leaders grow up in this country that have come over to sport that have had to leave the country to pursue that dream. So Rian Wilkinson is a great example, head coach. Um, Carmelina Moscato, another head coach. Karina LeBlanc, general manager now in Portland. Kaylin Kyle, commentator, killing it in the MLS. Um, so just some really incredible females that have come out but have had to leave the country. We also have two that have been able to stay in the country and done incredible things in Canada, but it's with the national team because there's no professional. So with Melissa Tancredi being the chiropractor with the national team and Robin Gale um, was our mental performance with the women's team for a very long time. Then she moved on to the men. Now, unfortunately, she's with TFC, but maybe we can change that in a few years. <laughs> um, but losing those people to either the men's game or to other countries to go and develop other countries' players, other countries' systems. Like, we want to be able to give those opportunities right here. Um, Canadian referees, like, giving them more of a platform to be able to grow the game here, get themselves into positions. You know, as a player, it's one thing to be 18, 19, you know, 23 years old, being offered a professional contract to go play somewhere. It's great. You get to pursue your dream and do that. If you're a referee, do you really want to be moving your life to other, like you want to pursue that dream here most likely, like coaches, like when you're older and you want to create that life, like it's really hard to keep chasing that dream from country to country to country. Like I said, it's different when you're a player because you kind of like feel that you're chasing the game, but I think it's all of these different positions. It's so important to give that opportunity right here um, to create that life, but also to follow that dream and pursue it right here in Canada. Um, the next one goes along as I was talking about coaching. Um, we also in Canada have one of the most expensive pay to plays um, in the world. And so that's a massive thing that I think we have to continue to invest in and change in this country, because if we want to grow the grassroots and get more and girls engaged in sport, a big one is having more women coaching. Um, inspiring them, creating more inclusive environments for young girls to grow up in the sport, to keep them in the sport. Having those female role models, those female leaders um, is so important for that. And so I think it's really important to continue to invest in that. Um, and I think a big thing for me is I look at our Whitecaps program and right now we get these great players into our academies and then we lose them. So we develop them and then we lose them because we have no more else to have them. We lose them to universities or we lose them to pro because we have nothing else to give them. But I think the really important thing for me is we're not just getting, you know, players that have no foundation and base. Like we're getting great players because of the great grassroots development that they are getting <coughs> from all the clubs. And so they come to us already with great foundations and already with great skill sets. And then we just take them to that next level. And so I think it's important that we continue the work together because we can't do it all. You guys can't do it all. But as we all work together, we can keep that pathway going nice and smooth and keep working on those partnerships to make sure that we're all continuing. But I think for me, the biggest thing is getting more women in coaching to continue to be those positive leaders for these young girls in sport. Um, the impact. So women's sports traditionally have a much closer tie to the community uh, than they do in men's sports. And I just really want to talk about, there's a couple stats that came out of the UEFA women's um, Euros that was held in London two years ago when England won. Um, there was a big report that was done on the impact of that tournament on the country and on the community. Um, so 88% of spectators coming out of that said that they were more likely to watch professional, international, and domestic competition of women's football in the future. For more than 416,000 new opportunities across the country in schools, clubs, in the communities to engage women and girls in grassroots legacy activities. This, this doesn't just mean playing, um, but this is also opportunities to play, to coach, to rep, to volunteer. So the impact that this has on the community is massive. More than half of local residents and about two in five spectators and volunteers 
were inspired to do more sport and physical activity as a result of the Women's Euro. This is a three-week tournament. The social impact of it, 74% of local residents feel that the Euros brought the community closer. 84% of participants re reported that participating in the, Euro in the Women's Euro Legacy Program has inspired their confidence and their self-esteem. So for me, seeing this come out of a three-week tournament, yes, it's an international tournament with national teams, but the impact that this can have on the community, on young girls, on women, over the span of an entire year, seeing this happen week in and week out, like that impact to me is so much greater than the impact of those 11 players that step on the field. And so I think for me, like that's what inspires me and drives me every day is to be able to see the impact on the fans, on young girls, on women being inspired to be in leadership positions. Like there's so much more to this than just putting professional players on the pitch. So investing in the women's game. So just because we're investing in women's professional sport, it doesn't end there. There's so much more that comes out of this. So as I've spoke about many times, it means investing in female leaders. It means investing in infrastructure, having more training facilities, better stadiums, um, more community engagement, job opportunities in and around the sport ecosystem, more opportunity for fans, for sponsors and partners who want to be involved in women's sport, who want to support women giving them that opportunity. Um, as Diana talked about, the Women's CONCACAF Champions League is coming. This is an opportunity for our region to be represented globally now. So it's not only in the domestic league where, you know, there's where the game of the week and there's maybe a highlight on BC or on Vancouver, but now all of a sudden we're playing against an NWSL team or a Mexican team or a team down in Honduras. There's going to be that global exposure for our region. And I think that that's also really important as well. Um, and then not only, and then also bringing in international players, being able to show them this beautiful city and province and country that we have. It's a very enticing place to want to be and already having conversations with international players, like this is an exciting opportunity for them. They all want to experience this country. Um, and then the last one, the social impact on gender equity, I think is, can't go untalked about and unnoticed. And um, that's going to be um, a massive, you know, we talk about being able to be gender equitable and gender equality, but if we don't have the opportunities, it's really hard to close that gap. And so this is closing that gap and giving us more of an opportunity in all of these ways. Um, along with, as I was talking about the pathway, um, so having that professional league, having that last piece of the pyramid, piece of the puzzle, um, is going to start to entice more Canadians to stay in Canada. So the enticement of going down to the NCAA is to then get exposed to either the NWSL um, or maybe a professional contract. That's really right now what the pathway is. So we're losing all our players to that. The excitement of this to me is we're going to have more Canadians staying in Canada, which means better for Canadian universities, more girls choosing to go through the U sports system because it's going to keep them in the eyes and ears of the Canadian professional system. If you want a chance to go train with the Canadian or with the Vancouver Whitecaps for a week, well, you want to be in BC so that you can get that opportunity. So if you're going to school at UBC or SFU, wherever you are, you're going to school and hey, we've got a you know a couple of midfielders who are sick and one that's got an injury, we need to fill in for a week. Well, we're going to get a local player. We're not going to fly someone in. So the opportunities for players to have that exposure is going to be what keeps them in to play in League One, to be able to once again be here in the summer when there's a professional team training and playing, to play in League One when you know you're that close and you're playing in and against the academy teams of the professional teams, like that's going to grow the game as well. And so for me, the impact of more BC girls, more Canadians staying in this country and choosing that path. Um, we talk about these professional players, you know, some of them are in top leagues for sure. Some of them are playing in second division France you know, in Iceland, in Cyprus, wherever it is. So they're playing in these leagues that, to be fair, League One is probably almost similar. So we get a lot of those players back and we can get them either into the pro team or we get them into League One. Like that's going to boost the whole system. And so I think that that impact of what more this is going to impact with the university to use for League One, it's going to grow the whole game as well. Just getting more players staying here in this country. This is the last one, which there's been so much talk around um, the women's game. Um, a lot of it, there's been a lot of talk about like 
ACL injuries. And it's not that ACL injuries haven't been happening. It's just now we're talking about them more and it's becoming a lot more of a conversation. And the problem is, is we don't have data experts in the women's game. We haven't had enough research done on female athletes. And so John Scott, one of the um, sports and conditioning coaches from the US for many, many years, she's with the Washington Spirit. Now she has dived into this massively and she has a huge um, uh, research that she's doing now, but we don't have a lot of experts in the women's game. So for us to be able to lead this and to have a league here where we start to gain knowledge around female athletes and what it means to actually train a female athlete, because we can't train female athletes the same as we train male athletes. And right now, the majority of what we do with female athletes is a cut and paste from the men's game. And this not isn't only at the professional level, this is at the grassroots level as well. So the more that we can study the women's game and female athletes and how we need to load them, how we need to recover, um, how we need to look at the women's menstrual cycle and how we need to look at everything about a female athlete, that's going to trickle down so that we can train eight-year-old females in a different way than we train eight-year-old males. And so the, ex the data experts that we can start to build around the women's game, and I really truly believe that this is one of the areas that in the women's game globally, we can be leaders. I think that we can like bypass a lot of the other countries that are not putting enough um, manpower and, and or woman power into this area. Um, so lastly, I'll just do some more specific updates on where we are at uh, with the White Caps. And so on our academy side, um, we have started investing a lot more into our girls' academy. Um, so taking away a lot of the costs that the girls have in terms of housing, billeting, schooling. Um, so we've invested a lot more into that. Uh, we've added some more full-time staff. Uh, so we now have full-time medical, we have full-time strength and conditioning and full-time uh, operations manager or operations coordinator. Um, and then we've partnered with the workshop clinic, which is where Melissa Tancredi and Selenia Yakeli work and own. Uh, for me, it was really important to build that partnership with them, not only because I think Melissa is one of the greatest chiropractors I've ever worked with in my entire life, um, but obviously an incredible role model for these young girls of somebody who's been through it um, and has the experience of working with the national team. So for our academy girls to be able to come through and have that type of medical support, I think is really um, important. And so that's kind of on the academy side. And on the women's side, uh, we've been doing a lot of branding work. So we're working with an agency um, because I'm a big believer that our women's team has to have their own look and feel. And so um, we are not going to look like our men's team or feel like our men's team. We're going to be different. And so we're going through a whole branding strategy along with how the league is. Um, they won't be called Project Eight. We are also going to have our own look and feel. Um, I've been doing a lot of club structure research um, comparables. Uh, so similar to what Diana was talking about, um, I'm studying other clubs and looking at the structures of other clubs around the world and then bringing that back to our unique environment, our unique um, structure here in Canada and what can work for us. So I've gone and done some different club visits. I've been connecting with a lot of different general managers and presidents of other clubs in the NWSL and Europe. Um, so trying to learn as much as I can to make sure that we build the right foundation from the start. Uh, I was just at the Women's Football Expo in Denmark um, same thing, connecting with other reps from uh, some of the top European clubs and some of the NWSL clubs, um, just building out, building connections and once again, making sure that we do this right. Um, infrastructure development explorations, we're looking at that here in Vancouver and area, looking at what the opportunities are for, um, most likely won't be happening in year one, but the opportunities for infrastructure development to make sure that we have a soccer specific stadium that's going to benefit uh, our women's team. I have no doubt that we're going to sell out BC Place in game one because we're going to have game one. <laughs> um, but like Diana said, for long term, I think it's really important to have something that's more soccer specific that's built for soccer, which we don't have in this country. So continuing to push on that. And that's what I have. Flew through. <laughs> So once again, if anyone has any questions, comments, and I'll say if you want to throw it to Dee as well. Um, yes? The thing that I like about this is you mentioned bringing in the local grassroots. Because I feel, for me, as a community soccer person, never coached the league, I think there's lots for the elite. And I agree, I think the league is the way to go. 
my concern is that the younger age groups, what are we doing to keep the young girls interested in the play? And I think, I think you've answered a lot of those questions in your presentation, and I, I'm, I'm glad to see that you, you're not just talking about what you are up there, you're talking about how to bring the kids from down here and show them a really good way, because I think we mentioned the dropout, and I think at the younger age groups now, particularly in certain areas, the money that people live in the area, they don't have access to cars, so they can't. The area that I come from, Burnaby, has lots of new immigrants. There's lots of kids that want to play, but there's all these other things, rent, all the rest of this comes into it. So I'm glad to hear that you're talking about bringing in and so that we can keep the kids interested, because I think that's where the future is. Thank you. I think, like, one thing, of course, like, I fully agree with that. And, you know, when we talk about the top, we're talking about that, you know, 1%. And so that's like, it's providing that opportunity for the ones that actually get there. But in order to get players there, you have to build that base and that foundation because you're not just going to find that one player when you're nine years old and be like, okay, let's get this player up to the pro game. Like, we have to build that base. And I think everyone who's made it to that, you know, 1% that's made it there, we all have that story of, when I was 10, when I was 14, I saw this and, you know, that was my, my moment was in 2002. Um, the women's U19 World Cup was in Edmonton. Um, they were playing at Commonwealth Stadium and it was, you know, the first time we really saw Christine Sinclair, Erin McLeod with her mohawk. Um, I think every girl after that was walking around with a mohawk um, for a couple of weeks. Um, like that was my moment. I was 15 years old at the time. I had just been cut from the U16 national team. Um, I was kind of in that moment of like, do I want to keep pushing? Like I was so sad I didn't make it, but I didn't know, like, should I keep going? And I went to that game and I'm sitting in the stands with 60,000 people and it still gives me goosebumps to think about. But like, I remember seeing them down on the field and being like, I want to be on that field. Like, I don't want to be in the stands. I want to be on that field. And so it's like, that was my moment. And Dee, I'm sure you had some moment of like this was the time and you know sink has talked about the 99 women's world cup like what was sink playing in that one probably anyways <laughs> um so it's like for me it's like we have to create those moments for those young girls and so it's like creating this talk but it's that moment that these young girls are going to have when they get to be in the stands and see these incredible and it's not only seeing the players on the field like i said it's seeing a female coach and maybe them being inspired that i want to be a coach or um maybe it's seeing female in a power suit on the side and saying, I want to be a general manager, like whatever it is, but it's, it's seeing these women following their dreams, following their passion that will inspire them to be something great, whatever that is. Yep. Um, you talked about the, the investment in the White House Academy system. Um, and we're so fortunate being here in the lower mainland to have that academy and the recs and then now the White Caps team, but when you're wearing your White Caps hat, how are you going to ensure equitable selection of players across all from all those League One teams, not just your own? Yeah, I think that's really important that we're discussing discussing right now in our soccer discussions that we're having with. We have a rep from each of the teams um, working with the league, and that's really important. What we're working on is that we have the right system in place in terms of the type of contracts we have because we've talked about the do we want to allow 15 year olds to sign? Like, what are we going to do with these youth contracts and how are we going to do it? If it's a player from our Academy versus a player from a different, like from the local area. And are we going to have, um, you know, someone to MLS where they have the, I don't know what it's called, but like the homegrown rights, um, all of these types of things. So we're going through all of these conversations. And I think that's really important because as I said, like this, the structure has to change because right now the structure is all built to find national team players. That's it. And so if you don't fit in that specific box of what they're looking at for the national team, you get left behind. And I'm a player that didn't fit in a box. D, I don't think is a player that fit in a box when you were growing up under the Evan Pellerou days. And so it's, it's about finding those players outside the box. And so the structure will change because right now the structure is around certain players. So we are having those discussions now on what we're going to, how it's going to look like in terms of that youth development and how we're going to integrate to have 
youth in the league, but at the same time, we don't want this to be a youth league. And we're very clear about that. Like this is an adult league. Um, there will be opportunities for that. Um, but there's a lot more that comes into it when you start signing 15, 16 year old players. And it's a lot more than them just being great players. There's so much around them being people um, that we have to learn from. And I've done some work with some of the NWSL teams that have those 15 year olds and learned from them in terms of the challenges that they face, because yes, they're performing on the field, but they have a whole whack of challenges off the field um, that they're trying to balance of being a high school kid playing, you know, Friday nights in front of 20,000 people, but then going to high school and trying to manage their social life and social media and everything. So um, that is something that we're actively looking at and building. And I think that that is really important, especially in this area, because there's such a like, um, high number of players that we have. And so being able to make sure that we give access to all different types of players. And I think that's something, like I said, that I'm really passionate about is I don't want to keep developing players that just fit in the national team model. I want something different because if our national team is going to change, we have to change it from down here. Um, as a mother of a daughter that just um, went through a, 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 all of the trying to figure out the universities, um, you mentioned earlier the, um, the trying to keep everybody in Canada. So she got maxed out like all of the colleges and universities she was talking to, um, giving her their maximum amount. How are we going to compete to keep them in Canada when we've got um, the schools in the states offering them everything? Yeah, uh, so number one, we'll fund it. That's the first one. Number two, uh, so that'll be part of some contracts is the funding of the academics and working with the U sports here as well. Um, number two is gonna be a massive part of, I think the exposure of seeing the level that it is down there, we can create that level here. Um, the NCAA level has changed drastically over the past few years um, and so, for some players, that's still going to be the pathway. That's still going to be the best opportunity for them, 100%. Some players might go for a year and come back. Some might go for three years and come back. Some might go for a full four years. I know I grew, I grew as a person in university. I didn't grow as a player. I probably went backwards as a player, but I grew as a person. And so for me, it was a big step in my life. I needed to do that before I went pro. But that was because we didn't have pro here. So I needed to kind of get that little bit of getting away, but still being in a bit of a shell and being babied for a bit. Um, before I was then sent off to be a pro and I was on my own to make decisions and cook for myself and um, yeah, know how to set my alarm and all those things. So um, I think it's what's important is there isn't going to be one pathway. There's going to be multiple pathways. But we, I truly believe that we can cr give the same level of play here in Canada as well as, to be honest, I think our academics are better in Canada. So sorry, still on that then. Yep. So how are you going to pick the ones like if, if, like you said yourself, you're out of the box type of a mm -hmm. player. Um, how are you going to pick those players that are going to get that full ride in Canada? Mm -hmm. Um, and over the like, is it just going to come through that that elite program, or is it going to be kind of looking for those players outside of the box too? Then? Yeah, I think it'll be a part of the scouting like uh, system in terms of like seeing what players are developing at what age. And you know, when you go to college, you're 16, 17 years old. Not all players are gonna be ready to be pro at 17, 18 years old. That's just gonna be a fact. And so it's gonna be a personal decision, a family decision. Uh, it's going to be a decision between, you know, if a club is wanting to invest in you at that age, there's gonna be a small percentage of like, you know, 16, 17 year olds that we choose to invest in. But for that player, maybe the better option will be to stay, to go to a Canadian university. And like I said, have that opportunity to be exposed to that professional team. So you may not be in the pro team, but to stay and play against them, to play in league one, to be exposed. Because as much as we are focused on that, we're constantly going to be looking at the area and the players coming up in the area. So, you know, someone like myself being able to be watching league one games, that's where I'm going to see players. That's where I'm going to see the talent that comes up. And so I think it's about being exposed. Like, you know, we talk about our national team right now for Bev Priestman to be keeping track of all the players that the Canadians that are playing, like 130 players playing in all these different professional leagues. Who knows how many are in the Canadian university system? Like to try to keep track of all that is next to impossible. 
And so it takes those players almost emailing the coach and saying, hey, here's my game film. Hey, watch this. Hey, you've seen that. Um, if we have all the players in one place, like how much easier is that for a coach, for general managers, for professional coaches, like to see the talent? So I think it's also going to be exposure of if you're here, you're going to get seen. So I think it's that idea too. But I am very well aware that uh, it's going to take time to change the mindset because every single player has gone through that. There's been, I think Jordan Heidema is maybe the only player that didn't go to college. We've had, I think, two that have made it, that Desi Scott and Kaylin Kyle that stayed in Canada, went through the Canadian youth sports system. Everyone else has gone to the state. So that's the pathway. That's what every kid grows up and knows. And so it's going to take time to, to shift that. And that's going to take also working with Canadian universities and that system to build that as well. Steph, can I answer that? Yep. I think, I think too, like that one's going to take time because I think if there's, there's a gap for sure of sporting and resources and NCAA and new sport. I think with the purely soccer hat on, the, the goal is to have the professional pathways so that as soon as you're a good enough soccer player, you're playing in the full professional pathway. And if you're in the full professional pathway, you're probably not actually going to be playing new sport at all. But we obviously as women athletes recognize the power of an education. So we want to work with universities to make sure even if you're in the pro pathway, you, not, you might not be playing for UBC's soccer team because actually you're in the academy or pro, but you're still getting an education. Uh, and I think if we build those programs, it's actually a strength to try and recruit international players too. international players like they, we want the full package and if we can come play pro somewhere, but also we're in this program in a top university, I think that can be a strength for our league in, in recruiting players. And then over time, our strong belief is that fewer and fewer kids are gonna choose to go to the NCAA, both because Steph said it, NCAA isn't de developing players the way it used to. Like when we went through, it was like NCAA women's national team. Now it's NCAA women's national team. And these guys are playing three months a year and it's still, you know, you're doing like the men's football weightlifting still half the time. Um, and I think it's actually going to be a detriment to the U.S. and player development that they are stuck in this NCAA eligibility. And if we can get more like the European model and just pro pathway soccer education, I think we can be good in good shape longer term. But yeah, it's, it, it could take five, ten years before it's really, you know, kids are choosing here nine out of ten times versus the reverse. Okay. Well, hopefully sooner. Yep. So, Steph, you've been on a year in this position as a general manager, is that right? Mm -hmm. Possibly. So, who is the peer that is in a similar role that you have uh, you know, you inspired by or you see as someone that you uh, see as a role model for you in this role that you're doing, uh, you, whether in North America or elsewhere? Uh, first name that comes to mind is Karina along um, being the general manager down at Portland Thorns. Uh, spoke with her a lot. Um, I think she's facing a lot of challenges there that we could say are similar, but also I think the good thing for me is I didn't come into this job with the team that I needed to perform like right now. And so I kind of have been able to learn and grow from a lot of different mentors. Um, I'm really lucky to have a lot of really close ones in the organization. I work really closely with Axel. And so having him as well, um, being able to learn from him, I think as well, just for me, like I've been putting myself out there. I've been trying to learn from some of the European clubs from getting myself to these football expos to learn from different people, because I think it's really important not to be super narrow focus. And like Diana said, like surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. So I've tried to really put myself in positions where I'm having conversations and talking with people who have been in those positions for much longer. I went down and spent a weekend with Angel City, um, worked with their general manager there. So I think it's just really important for me to have a wide range of that. Um, but the closest person I say is Karina. Yep. Steph, just a, just a comment. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, your, your focus and your, your points are that it's, it's very narrow right now, the pathway. Um, it's going to get bigger, and I just want you to know that I think you know, BC Soccer is along on this journey with you guys. 
Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that, that when you're at the table, but I also think that there may be opportunities to share in some of these, especially around the data analytics, and especially around social, economic, and mm -hmm. mental aspects of, of the female game. I mean, we are using female athletes as well. Uh, and then that is a continual pathway. So the stronger the grassroots gets, obviously, you can continue to work on your program. So I'd like to know that somewhere in the future, I know you guys are busy, but that there is those discussions about partnership and working together, um, and sharing best practices, and, and continuing to funnel through the White Caps program. Yeah. Thank you. Good? Yeah. Thank Any you. Questions? Any questions? No? Um, thank you both for coming and speaking today. Um, you got big supporters in BC and BC Soccer, as you both know. Um, Following up on Hale mentioned, let us know what we can do to help. But let's get a round of applause from everyone. <laughs> Uh, Men's World Cup update from the Thank you.